must learn how to manage what you have found. It's you that found the person, it's not me. So we must learn how to manage what we have chosen. Okay, so but those of you that are still at the beginning stage, all that I want you to know that let do not become a warning note. Be careful who you describe as your dream spouse. I am saying this not because I don't believe that there are dream spouse that it doesn't exist. I believe that there are dream spouse. It exists. Okay? But if you look at statistics of divorce, you will know why I am beginning from this warning note. Most of African countries don't have a solid statistics. So let's use United States. I want you to see this. I want to show you two statistics from United States. One is the divorce rate. And the second one is going to be the marriage rate. And this is based on 2019 statistics. It says that every 42 seconds, there is one divorce in the United States. Every 42 seconds. I didn't say every 42 minutes. I said every 42 seconds, there's one divorce happening in the United States. And that equates to 86 divorce per hour. Every one hour in the United States, there are 86 marriages that break. So per day, we're looking at 2,046 marriages that breaks on daily basis. And that means that in one week, we have 14,000 364 marriages that break per week in the United States. And if you calculate that in one year, you have 746,971 marriages that break per year in the United States. So you can understand why I'm starting from that one note. Let's look at their marriage rates. In the United States, every 16 seconds, there is a marriage taking place in the United States. Every 16 seconds. That then means that in every one hour, you are having 230 marriages contracted in the United States. In a week, you have 38,762 marriages per week. And in a year, you have 2.2 million, 15,603 per year. So you see that almost all these particular marriages that are happening in the United States, all of them happen to be believed spouse, dream spouse. Why will you take a lady to the altar if that lady wasn't your dream spouse? So almost all of them, almost all of them that goes in and you see them break. They all claim that I married my dream spouse. But we're going to look at something very significant and why I really don't believe in marrying 
your dream spouse. I love to explain why I don't believe that your dream spouse might be your value spouse. And this for you to understand, I want us to look at what happens to the human brain when you fall in love. Every one of the people who are around me on this platform and those who have attended some of my marriage se uh, um, um, seminars and conferences, they know that I normally warn, don't fall in love. Don't fall in love. Don't try to fall in love. You can have a better marriage not falling in love. And this is why I want to explain it tonight. Falling in love is a feeling of a wide wind of emotions. Wide wind of emotions. That's what we call falling in love. There's a professor of neurology that took us some time to conduct a scientific experiment investigation of what happens to the human brain when a man or a woman falls in love. Those of you that have your spouse or your fiancé on this platform, we're going to deal with certain things that you will relate with or you will relate to. So these are things that she found out. She found out, number one, that what we call falling in love or what causes people to fall in love is not just God. It's chemistry. It's chemicals that are released in our bodies. She said that a concussion of hormones that begins to brew and activates a particular center of our brain that is called the reward system of the brain. And that is what sponsors that thing you call uh, just falling in love. I want us to look at some of those chemistries, some of those chemicals. From there, we begin to drill deep, right, deeper right now. You know, when you talk about romance or romantic love, we are talking about a strong attraction for someone, right? A strong attraction for someone a feeling of strong attraction for someone. The moment you have these strong feelings of attraction, either for someone or in a place, you activate a particular part of your brain that is called the reward center of your brain. And the moment that aspect of your brain is activated, there are certain hormones that are released into your blood system. And these chemicals is what you call love. She was able to show us some of these chemicals. The first one she told us is yes, what you is call right. ozitocin. Please follow me. Ozitocin. I don't know if they can put it up in the screen. Ozitocin. Ozitocin is a particular hormone that when you have strong attraction for someone, that strong feeling of strong attraction activates a particular part of your brain and causes it to release this hormone called oxytocin. What does this hormone do? It is called bonding hormones. Bonding hormones. Oxytocin is a natural hormone that manages key aspects of female and male 
reproductive system. It also plays a role in labor. And even when a woman delivers, it's also responsible for lactation of a woman. But the main aspect of oxytocin is increases bonding, bonding between mother and the child, or even bearing attitude between a male or, or a female that have strong attraction. That's what the work of oxytocin does when it is released in your blood system. Another hormone that is re released, according to this scientific discovery, is the one you call vasopressin. Vasopressin. It is called the jealousy, met, garden, and pairing hormone. It's a particular hormone that is responsible in those who are loved protecting their loved ones. When you are falling in love, you don't want another lady to tamper with your man. And your man does not want to see you chat with another woman. It's a work of a super pressing. It prepares your body that way. You become territorial aggressive around your loved one. If they chat with another woman, you want to break the phone, vasopressin at work. It's a chemical that is released in your body. You know, when we talk about things like this, some people, when they fall in love, they deny it. At the initial stage, no, 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 I'm not in love with him. But if you're not in love with him, why are you overprotective? Why are you jealous of other people coming together? We can see the presence of vasopressin acting in your body. So we now know that even though you deny it, you are in love. Now the third one is what you call dopamine. Dopamine is another hormone. Dopamine is responsible. It is called Happy hormone is responsible for pleasure. Happy additive hormone. Anything that gives you pleasure will trigger the release of dopamine. Dopamine acts like cocaine. It acts like a drug. It acts like alcohol. You know, there are people who are happy. Even if their house is burning, if they are taking drugs, they are just, they forgot about the house that is burning. Under the action of dopamine, they are happy even if they are slicing their children. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a chemical, a chemical called dopamine. Now, these are the concussion of hormones release into our blood system the moment we find somebody attractive, be it a male or a female, at the initial stage, these things are going on in your body. And you said, I found my remissing grip. I found my bone. He must be the one. That's a dream man. It's not anything dream. Is chemicals. You are like a man and a woman who are taking drugs. It will clear maybe in six months or in one year. So that's why we call it dream. We call it my dream man. This must be my dream man. This must be my dream woman. Let me tell you, when you make decisions under this oxytocin, Vasopressin, ah, dopamine. In less than no time, when it clears, you will find out that that wasn't you that did. It wasn't your decision. It was the decision of chemicals. 
there's another hormone that was discovered by this woman, this neurologist, that is always in a decreased level the moment a man or a woman falls in love. It is called serotonin. Serotonin reduces. They found out that it's serotonin reduction. Now, what does this particular hormone, what does it do? Serotonin. Serotonin is regulatory and is a particular hormone that tries to caution you. They try to put fear. It, it regulates you so that you can avoid certain things and put you in a shape where you are not overreactive. But it was discovered that when a man or a woman falls in love, serotonin is reduced. That natural secretion from your brain that God put to regulate you, make you become reasonable. So what are we talking about? When a man falls in love or a woman is already in love, that aspect of your body, brain, that is in charge of reasoning, that is in charge of logical approach in life, it is called the cerebral cortex. That part of your brain is completely dead. It died. It's not functioning again. You see why those who are close to me, I tell them, I don't cancel those who I love. It's a waste of time. If you want to cancel a person, cancel them before they fall in love. If they are falling in love, a man in love does not hear because his cerebral cortex is dead. He doesn't hear. The cerebral cortex is the area of memory. It's that aspect of your brain that is in charge of your memory. So memory is dead, so she cannot fall in love with the man who shot his father and defend it because it's not reasoning anymore. Cerebral cortex dead. Serotonin reduce. Dopamine high. Vasopressin high. Ozytocin high. They don't listen anymore. And that's what they say, that that is the dream man. The thinking area is dead. They don't learn anything. Emotion is dead. No feelings. So the man can abandon the wife with five children and follow side chick and waka because celebrity cortex is dead. He can only wake up after these chemicals have dried up. I'm taking this time to let you know that decisions made over this particular chemicals will never be the right decision for marriage. And that's why I came to you to tell you, don't marry your dream man. Don't marry that thing you call dream woman. That's not the way to find love. Most of that thing that is called love is chemical. As a matter of fact, don't fall in love. Your great-grandfather's marriage, the marriage rate, the marriage rate of our fathers, great-grandfathers, you will never hear divorce. Yet they did not fall in love. Some of them, it was not even their decision. There were some values before anybody would go into any family to get married. It's not by love. They said, no, we know that family. Everybody in that family, they are honest. They are values. They are, they are honest people. They are logical. They are hardworking. Go there, my child. Go and marry. 
and you go there marry and you stay in marriage for 30, 40 years. But we have thrown away values and we have replaced values with love. And every 46 seconds, marriage is breaking. Do you understand now? So, my context of um, dream man and dream woman is based on this chemical love. Put it aside. That's not how to find the woman that will take you for 30, 50 years. So I haven't come to understand what I call dream man, which I said, don't go there. Let's really get into how to find a value-adding woman, a value-adding man, the one that you're supposed to get married to. Are we okay now? So, the first thing I want you to understand is that your marriage is the product of your decision. Please write it down. Your marriage is the product of your decision. Please write it down. If I want, if I, if I, if I am your shoes, I'm going to say my marriage is a product of my decision. I've held this thought for many years. I've seen people who are not comfortable whenever I discuss on this subject. Well, let's look at it tonight. I'm going to say certain things that please, if you don't understand it, write it down and make your own personal research. God has, God has never given anyone a spouse without involving them in the decision making. God have never done it. Forget about all the testimonies we say, oh, God, give me. You know, I was on the mountain and I was praying. And God gave me. God desired you. I'm, you know, the, the, the most, ah, the most, the most ignorant thing a man can do is to go to a lady, to harass the lady. The Lord said, I should marry you. That's not how to approach a lady. If you've been doing that, stop doing it. Because you're lying without knowing. You might be sincere, but you're lying. God doesn't give anybody, any wife. From the pages of the scripture, God has never given any man any wife. Understand that the greatest risk God took in the creation of man is to give a man, wait, Lord, listen to what I'm about to say, to give a man two things. The power of choice and the right of choice. That was the greatest risk God took in the creation of man. Let me explain that. The power of, of choice given to man is God saying to a man, man, you have the ability to choose Whatever you want and whatever you want to have. That's the first aspect of it. It gave us the power of choice. You can choose. 
You can choose not to serve God. You can choose to serve God. It's up to you. That's what the power of choice, he gave us the ability to do that. And the second thing, the second phase of it is the right of choice. The right of choice. You know, you can make a choice, you don't have the right to make it. Like angels can make choices, but they don't have the right to make choices. But God gave man both the power of choice and the right of choice. The right of choice means man, whatever you have chosen for yourself, you are authorized to become or to have it. And nobody can change it without you approving for the change. This is the right of choice. And when God gave man the right of choice, look at how risky it is. Even when man choose not to serve God, God have no right to change that choice except he walk on man to cooperate with him to change it. This is the reason why Jesus has died for over 2,000 years, and there are people who have not been saved. Because is there right? Anyone, God or Satan, that tries to get a man to change his choice without that man's approval is violating the man. So that's the greatest risk God took, is to give man the power and the right of choice. Now bring it down to marriage. Bring it down to marriage. Marriage is a choice. Marriage is a choice and not by force. I want you to write that down. Marriage is a choice and not by force. Marriage is a choice and not by force. <laughs> Did you hear that? So I want you to know, I, 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 I'm going to do something quickly because of my time. Marriage is by choice and not by first right. And God has never chosen any spouse for anyone before. Please understand my emphatic statement because this is scriptural. I say it again. God has never chosen any spouse for any man. He's never done it before. I want us to go through scriptures quickly. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see some scriptures quickly. The popular scripture that you know in um, Genesis chapter 2 quickly because of my time. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. I love to run through that scripture quickly for you. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Everybody say alone. I'm going to take time to break this scripture down for you. Alone. 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 Listen. Alone means having no one else present. It means having no complementary part alone. Listen, that doesn't mean lonely. Oh, dear Lord Jesus. Listen, you can be alone and not lonely. Mm. Loneliness is different from being alone. Loneliness is a psychological issue. It is a sad feeling of being not connected with a significant relationship. That's what loneliness is. Adam was not lonely, but Adam was alone. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? 
You can be alone and still not lonely. And you can also be with crowd and still lonely. So alone, aloneness and loneliness is not the same thing. Now I'm dragging this to a particular point. Don't marry because you are lonely. People want to use marriage to cure their loneliness. Marriage does not cure loneliness. Loneliness is an indication of a bigger problem. Are you ready to hear this? Loneliness is an indication that you don't love staying with yourself. You hate staying with yourself. You don't enjoy staying with yourself. I don't know why. Maybe you don't like yourself. Or maybe there are certain part of you that comes out when you are all by yourself that threatens you. But loneliness is an indication that you don't love connecting with yourself. Listen, people who marry because they are lonely will end up using their spouse as clutches instead of ladders. That's the people who are insecure in marriage. Because they don't know how to be with their self. They use their spouse as dopamine, drugs. You made me feel angry. You made me sad. I made up my mind. If you don't behave well, I will never be happy. So you don't know how to manage yourself. That is a problem. Loneliness is a problem. You got to achieve loneliness. You got to get out of loneliness before ever you need marriage. Because I hear it many times today. People say, I need to get married because I'm lonely. What happened to your purpose? What happened to your life? What happened to staying with yourself? Adam was not lonely. Adam was only alone. Marriage is... Marriage is not an automatic cure for loneliness. Take us some time, ask some married people. A lot of married people are lonely. Telling you that marriage is not an automatic cure for loneliness. I don't know what they told you. But if you ask some sincere married people, they will tell you that you can marry and your loneliness will get worse. Because marriage was not designed to cure loneliness. What God was doing, dealing with in Genesis 2.18 was not loneliness. He was dealing with aloneness. 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 Adam was alone, but he was not lonely. So let's see this, the 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 solution God proffered to him, the Lord said something to me, said, in order to cure your aloneness, I'm going to get you a help met, a help meet. It is I'm going to get, get you a wife. Please don't read in what is not there. A help meet is not a wife. Whew. Are you still there? Put your questions in the group. I will answer it. I'll come back to the WhatsApp to give you answers. If you have any question, please write it down on the um, Zoom chat room. I will be able, you put it down in the WhatsApp. I'll, I'll really go there to answer it. Now, but I want you to understand that when God said, I will make him a help mate, he did not say wife. A help meet is not a wife. A help meet is a suitable, that word help meet is a suitable, adapted, 
complementary companion who is necessary in partnership. Let me say it again. The word help me from the Hebrew word. If you read AMPC version, he broke it down very well. It means, a help me means a suitable, adapted, complementary companion who is necessary in partnership. That role is not the role of a wife. That role is not the role of a wife. It's a role of a value-adding partner, which is of wider application compared to the narrow relationship of a wife and a husband. Because your brother can be your helpmate. Your dad can be your helpmate. Meet. Male or female can be your help meet. It talks about a suitable, complementary. In your business, you need a help meet. In every area of your life, that's not exclusively the work of a wife. It's not the duty of a wife. It's good that your wife come to that point. But the application of help meet is bigger than just having a wife. So help me can be fulfilled by any gender, even a biological brother or sister, even a mother or a father. So God said, I'm going to make a help me, not a wife. Now, the moment God declared that, he went into a search, into a journey. This time around, he was going with Adam. He said, come, let's go find you a help meet. Then went into a hunt. Look at verse 19 quickly. Genesis 2, 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he will call them and whatsoever he called them, every living creature, that was, that was the name thereof. Notice that each time God found something that looked like a help me to Adam, he brought it to Adam and said, Adam, look at this. Is it a help me for you? Adam said, no, that's a chimpanzee. God brought that one. He brought a snake. He shook it. He said, Adam, can this be your helpmate? He said, no, that is a snake. What about dog? He brought a dog. He shook it and said, Adam, can this dog be your help me? He said, no, uh, it, it, that's a dog. In verse, let's, let's read it down. I want you to see that. Please, you need to go to, through this journey with me. Now, in verse 20, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. So that's what he was looking for with God. That's what they were searching in all the bears, all the animals. And when they couldn't find any suitable, adapted, complementary companion who could necessarily be in partnership with Adam, God said, oh boy, since we didn't find anything in all this one, can you lie down? God put him to sleep. God put him to sleep. This was real Adam. This was Adam. So if Adam had chosen the dog as a helpmeet, there wouldn't have been a woman. Because the reason why God now said, okay, lie down, let's check inside of you, <laughs> was because there was no helpmeet. If Adam had chosen dog, women, uh, 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 you would have not come out here. It was just because there was none with dog, none with all animal. God now said, okay, lie down. When Adam couldn't choose any other creature, 
God presented to him, God now said, okay, let's make a woman. God said, let's make a woman. Now, I want to talk to you, every female in this place. I want to speak to you from the revelations of this scripture. And I want you to take what I'm talking to you about, what I'm about to say very serious, make it a principle of your life. Every of my daughter that is on this page, listen to me. Every woman getting into any kind of partnership with a man, whether it's a business partnership or a marriage partnership, I said marriage partnership, not marriage slavery, marriage partnership. Because that's what it is. Whatever partnership you are getting into with a man or a male man, you must, you should value yourself as a significant and complementary part of that man. That's who you are. A significant complementary part. And if any man who you are about to partnership with does not see you that way, better get out of that relationship. Get out immediately. In fact, don't even say yes to it. Because that's who you are. That's how you can only be fulfilled. So in verse 21 and 22, that's where I'm going to stop now. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. Hmm. Every man looking for a woman must know how to sleep before God. Listen to me. Even those of us that are married, if you really, really want to be formed, put your husband to sleep. Otherwise, your form will not come out. Okay, and the Lord God caused him to sleep, and when he was sleeping, God brought out that beautiful damsel out of him. Verse 22 says, And they reap which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Interesting. It's interesting to me. What is very much interesting to me here is that scientifically it has been discovered that every animal, dogs, cats, every other animal, all of them, they have 13 ribs. Jake's 13 ribs. Only men have 12 ribs. So what happened to the other one? Amen. So the reap that God took from Adam was to show that the woman he have just made need to work in partnership, side by side with the man. That's what God shows in this particular place. And now in verse 23 it says, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He shall be called woman because he was taken out of man. See, when God created a woman, it was not a wife. God did not create a wife. God created a woman. Look at it. I just said, called her a wife because she, a woman because she was taken out of a man. A woman is not a wife. This means that God never created a wife for Adam. He created a woman. So how did a woman become a wife? A woman, became, a, a woman becomes a wife by decision, not by creation. So I'm bringing you back to where we started. Marriage is by decision. God never created a wife. God created a woman. You become a wife by decision, not by creation. So everything about marriage rises and falls on decision. A wife is a decision a woman made 
to accept the decision of a man who desired to become her husband. That's who a wife is. A wife is not a woman. A wife is a decision. A woman made to accept the decision a man who desires to be her husband made. So marriage from A to Z is decision. But the question I want to ask quickly because of my time, the question I want to ask is, whose decision made you a wife? Whose decision made you a husband? Whose decision made you a wife and whose decision made you a husband? Is it a decision of God? God does not make that decision. He presents you make the decision. So do not allow your father's decision. It's not the father's, your father's decision. Your father's decision should not make you a wife or make you a husband. Your friend's decision shouldn't be the decision that made you a husband or a wife. It must be your decision. And that decision must be made in that version of you that is matured. Because decision is the evidence of maturity. There are people that can never get married. Jesus said so. Jesus gave us five people. I want you to read this. I don't have time to read it right now. I want you to read Matthew chapter 19, 11 to 12. Message Bible. Matthew chapter 19, 11 to 12. Message Bible. Let me, let me just read it quickly and then... We get to it. But Jesus said, not everyone is matured enough to live a married life. It is said not everybody is matured enough to marry. He said, Ev not everybody is matured enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some from birth seemingly Never give marriage a thought. Others never get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. Quickly, let me just show you this and then we close. Five kinds of people that Jesus listed that we remain unmarried, that I call them unmarriageable, unmarriageable people. I mean, Jesus said that these people cannot get married. Number one, from that scripture, people who lack the maturity to live the married life. The moment you lack the maturity to live the married life, you cannot, you are not, you are not marriageable. You're not matured enough. It takes maturity. It doesn't take maturity to wait, but it takes maturity to get married, to live the married life. Number two, people who haven't gotten the skills that enables marriage management. When you are not equipped, when you are not trained, when you have not acquired skills, to manage marriage, you're not going to succeed in marriage. Jesus said you are unmarriageable. Number three, people who decided not to make marriage a part of their lives. You can hear some people that say, well, I don't think I want to get married. I don't think we want to get married. What you're saying is that marriage is not a part of your life. God is not going to force you. It's all about decision. It got to come from you. Marriage is a choice and not a force. Number four, people who no one will ever ask or accept to get married with or married to, you will never get married. Listen to me. 
I know there are some of you ladies, when people have asked you your hand for, for marriage, you insult them. You made them look as idiots just because they call you on phone and said, I want to get married unto you. And you insult all of them. If you keep on doing that, you know that you are falling into the category of people or people that will never get married. When people ask your hand in marriage, it's a testimony. You need to thank God that at least you are a marriage candidate. But that does not mean you will marry every cat and dog that shows up around you. Number five, people whose commit commitments in their assignment will never allow to get married. People of God, I have a lot of things to tell you on this issue. I would have loved to show you how to make a quality choice in your marriage, but my time is already out there. I believe that we have another time. Tomorrow we are going to stand and talk about how to take your marriage to a very level that is beyond divorce. But if you have questions, please get down to the uh, WhatsApp group right now. Put your questions in the WhatsApp group, and I'm going to come and answer you. But our program for today, because of the limited time, has come to an end. But don't forget, tomorrow, another one hour we're going to have. God bless you. I pray that your marriage will be a blessing. In Jesus' mighty yeah. name we pray. Amen and amen. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, sir. Your friends you, much longer. God Thank loves you much longer. Your friends much longer. But Thank you. By and I